Hi everyone. The purpose of this video is, one, to ask those in support of international protection to consider what is your number? And by this I mean, is there any cap you would put on international protection applicants or would you really burden Ireland with accepting uncapped numbers of migrants? And two, to review the immigration laws currently in place in Ireland while also answering the question, what are our obligations regarding those seeking international protection under EU law? which will then allow us to consider the potential counter arguments that may be advanced to politicians and the media, etc. when they say we are obliged to accept an uncapped number of persons seeking international protection under international law. So we will start this video with what is your number? To fully consider this point, you need the following information. The last statistical report prepared by the International Protection Office confirms that in the year from January 2022 to November 2022, there were a total of 12,453 applications for international protection in Ireland. This was up from only 2,649 applications in 2021. These figures representing a five-fold increase and historic high in asylum applications in Ireland. These type of asylum application figures have not been seen in Ireland since 2003, when public unrest led to the 2003 referendum which closed a constitutional loophole which granted citizenship by birth. After this referendum, the number of persons arriving in Ireland fell dramatically. In response to a parliamentary question from Fianna Fáil TD Joe Flaherty, the escalating cost to the Irish taxpayer of providing emergency accommodation in hotels, pubs and B&Bs has become clearer. The monthly cost rose from 22 million in May to 36 million in October. The overall cost for that six month period was 166 million or over 300 million if extrapolated to a full year. This figure of 300 million is in addition to the budget of 225 million, which had already been set for the running of direct provision centres. While it is difficult to get full disclosure on the true cost to the Irish taxpayer, it would appear that in 2022, the cost of international protection alone, which excludes accommodating Ukrainians, was well over half a billion euro. Now, these are the costs and numbers that apply to Ireland. But to those who would accept uncapped numbers of international protection applicants, we must also look to the EU figures. Because according to the European Council of the European Union, asylum seekers travel around Europe and apply for asylum in countries where they believe they have the highest chance of receiving international protection. So depending on the number of applications Ireland is prepared to process, the more applicants Ireland will receive. With regard to the EU figures, in the EU in November 2022 alone, so for the month of November, there were a total of 107,223 applications for international protection. According to the European Union Agency for Asylum, this was the third consecutive month where the EU had received approximately 100,000 applications per month. Now, these numbers are in addition to Ukrainian seeking protection, which alone is said to cost in excess of 1 billion in Ireland in 2023 alone. So let's say that approximately 13,000 applicants for international protection would cost the Irish taxpayer approximately 500 million per year. Now, let's say if Ireland were willing to accept a cap of 100,000 applications per year, the cost to the Irish taxpayer would be 3 billion, 846 million, 153,846 euro and 15 cent. It should be noted that this equates to a cost of 38,000 per year for accommodation and meals alone per person. But remember also that on top of that cost goes medical costs, legal costs, education costs, etc. That said, it should be noted that some reports suggest that the cost of accommodating an asylum seeker per year is approximately €26,000 or €70 Euro per night. However, this figure does not appear to marry with the overall costs per year that have been discussed in Dáil committees or parliamentary questions. I personally believe the cost of international protection to the Irish taxpayer is so high that we will never have full disclosure on the true cost. So when people are literally dying on trolleys and living on the streets, ask yourself how much worse the Irish situation could actually become if we continue to accept an uncapped numbers of persons seeking international protection. The second part of this video will look at laws around immigration and asylum. 
So as part of this video, we're going to discuss and review the following laws. One, the Treaty of Amsterdam in 1997. Two, the Dublin Three Regulations 2013. Three, the International Protection Act 2015. And four, a new pact on migration and asylum proposed by the European Commission in September 2020. So we will start by discussing the Amsterdam Treaty. In general, the law of the European Union applies to all 27 member states. However, occasionally member states negotiate certain opt-outs from legislation or treaties of the European Union, meaning they do not have to participate in certain policies regardless of what laws the EU may put in place across the European Union. Currently, only three member states have such opt-outs. Denmark has two, Ireland has two and Poland has one. The United Kingdom had four before leaving the European Union. For the purposes of this video, we are only concerned with the opt-outs that Ireland has. So Ireland has an opt-out from EU legislation adopted in the areas of freedom, security and justice. This allows Ireland to opt in or out of legislation and legislative initiatives on a case-by-case -case basis in these three specific areas. The opt-out from freedom, security and justice policy was originally obtained by Ireland and the United Kingdom in a protocol to the Treaty of Amsterdam of 1997 and was retained by both with the passing of the Treaty of Lisbon in 2008. To understand what is included in the areas of freedom, justice and security, you must go back to the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, which was signed in 1958. The Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union at Articles 67 to 89 confirms that freedom, justice and security includes the following policy areas. 1. Asylum. 2. Rules concerning external borders. 3. Immigration policies and policies concerning third country citizens. 4. Combating illegal drugs. 5. International fraud. 6. Judicial cooperation in civil matters. 7. Judicial cooperation in criminal matters. 8. Customs cooperation and 9. Police cooperation for preventing and fighting terrorism, drugs, trade, etc. What this means is that Ireland is not bound by EU law in the areas of immigration or asylum, but where the EU makes a legislative proposal in these areas, Ireland has three months to decide whether they wish to opt into those discussions. If they do not opt into those discussions, they are deemed to have opted out and the discussions simply go ahead without them. Any legislation thereafter which is adopted in any of these areas binds the other member states but not Ireland. Just to be crystal clear that there is absolutely no doubt as to the accuracy of this information, I would direct you to review the European Commission website where there is a fact sheet dated the 28th of February 2021 titled Ireland's Participation in EU Schemes to Relocate and Resettle Refugees. You will note that this site states the following. The EU has never forced Ireland to take in refugees or immigrants. In fact, Ireland has no obligation to take in refugees, as along with Denmark, it has an opt-in or opt-out clause on justice and immigration measures under the Lisbon Treaty. However, Ireland voluntarily agreed to fully participate in the EU relocation and resettlement schemes set up in response to the migrant crisis that peaked in 2015. So if a politician tells you that Ireland must accept uncapped numbers of persons seeking international protection under international law, your answer should be the following. Is it not the case that Ireland originally obtained an opt out in the areas of freedom, security and justice, which includes immigration and asylum policy under the Treaty of Amsterdam of 1997, with this opt out being retained by Ireland with the passing of the Treaty of Lisbon in 2008? Considering I know this to be the case, are you saying that Irish politicians opted into immigration and asylum laws without having any international obligation to do so? And if this is the case, is your argument around commitments to international law not disingenuous? So to be crystal clear, Ireland is not legally required to accept any laws around immigration or asylum that the EU may wish to implement across the Union. If Ireland has or does accept any such laws, this is a decision made by the Oireachtas and not by virtue of a requirement of international law. The second area that we will look at is the Dublin Three Regulations. On the 15th of June 1990, the Dublin Convention was signed. This convention determines the EU member state responsible for examining an application for international protection. The current Dublin Three Regulations applies to what are called the Dublin Countries. So under this regulation, the Dublin countries include 
all the countries in the EU plus Iceland, Switzerland, Norway and Liechtenstein. The Dublin Regulation is also called the Dublin 3 Regulation simply because it is the third version of the agreement that was originally signed in 1990 and came into force in September 1997. Just to be clear, this regulation is called the Dublin Regulation simply because this regulation was originally signed in Dublin. Broadly speaking, all three Dublin regulations are based on the same principle that the first member state where fingerprints are stored or an asylum claim lodged is responsible for a person's asylum claim. The Dublin 2 regulation was adopted in 2003, replacing the Dublin Convention in all EU member states except Denmark, which has an opt out from implementing regulations in the areas of freedom, security and justice. On the 3rd of December 2008, the European Commission proposed amendments to the Dublin regulation, which resulted in the Dublin 3 regulation being approved in June 2013. Now, the provisions of the Dublin 3 regulation are far more favourable to countries like Ireland than most other EU countries, as given our geographical location, it is quite likely that a person will have made an application for international protection in another Dublin country before journeying to Ireland. As part of an application for international protection, the International Protection Office who we will refer to as the IPO going forward, is entitled to take the applicant's fingerprints and photograph and check this information against data held by EuroDAC. EuroDAC is an EU database that stores the fingerprints of international protection applicants or people who have crossed a border illegally. If the IPO have reason to believe that another country should be responsible for an applicant's application for international protection, it should use the Dublin procedures to determine which country is responsible and the IPO is not meant to examine the details of an application for international protection until it has made a decision using the Dublin 3 regulations. Under the Dublin 3 regulations, there are several reasons why Ireland might be entitled to transfer an applicant back to another Dublin country, such as 1. The applicant's husband or wife or dependent children have international protection or are asylum seekers in another Dublin country. 2. The applicant has or previously had a visa or residence permit in another Dublin country. 3. The applicant's fingerprints were taken in another Dublin country. Or 4. There is evidence that the applicant was in another Dublin country, even if their fingerprints were not taken. So if a politician says Ireland must accept uncapped numbers of persons seeking protection under international law, your answer should be is it not the case that under the Dublin 3 regulations, the International Protection Office should be taking fingerprints from all international protection applicants and checking these against Eurodac to determine whether that application should be determined by another member state, thereby potentially allowing Ireland to legally transfer a large number of applicants back to another Dublin country? Considering Ireland's geographical location, I would expect that a large number of those seeking international protection in Ireland are inadmissible applications under the Dublin 3 regulations. Can you tell me if Ireland is fully utilising the Dublin 3 regulations? If yes, can you tell me the percentage of applicants being transferred to another Dublin country? And if Ireland is not fully utilising the Dublin 3 regulations, is it disingenuous to suggest that we must accept an uncapped number of migrants under international law, considering policy makers appear to be selectively choosing which international laws to adhere to? The third area we will review is the International Protection Act 2015. So the International Protection Act 2015 is Ireland's key piece of law enshrining the state's obligations regarding claims for asylum. Under the International Protection Act, persons coming to Ireland can claim international protection in three ways. One, by claiming refugee status. Two, by claiming subsidiary protection status. Or three, by securing a permission to remain from the Minister for Justice. Permission to remain is available to applicants on humanitarian grounds where they have failed both the refugee and subsidiary protection procedures. Persons can apply for international protection in Ireland for two reasons. One, where they have a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, and they cannot seek the protection of their own country. This is called refugee status. Or two, where they cannot return to their own country because they are at risk of serious harm, but where they do not qualify as a refugee. This is called subsidiary protection status. The International Protection Act at Section 21 sets out the circumstances under which an application for international protection is inadmissible and this includes the following. 
One, where another member state has granted refugee status or subsidiary protection status to the person. Two, where a country other than a member state is a first country of asylum for the person. Or three, where the person arrived in the state from a safe third country that is a safe country for that person. With respect to safe countries, the last update to the list of safe countries was enacted through Statutory Instrument 121 of 2018, whereby the Minister for Justice designated the following countries as safe countries. Albania, Bosnia, Georgia, Kosovo, Macedonia, Montenegro, Serbia and South Africa. That said, a person can still apply for international protection if they are from a safe country of origin, if they can submit serious grounds that the country is not safe in terms of their circumstances. So if we now look at the last statistical report prepared by the International Protection Office regarding the top nationalities who are applying for international protection in Ireland, we can see that the highest percentage of applicants are arriving in Ireland from Georgia at over 20%. That said, it is quite likely, given the geographical location of the other top nationalities, that the majority of these applicants landed in another EU member state before Ireland, and this should therefore trigger the transfer of that applicant back to an other EU member state under the Dublin 3 regulations. So, if a politician says Ireland must accept uncapped numbers of persons seeking international protection under international law, your answer should be According to statistics prepared by the International Protection Office, over 20% of applicants applying for international protection in Ireland are coming from Georgia. Noting that Georgia was declared a safe country of origin through statutory instrument 121 of 2018. This would suggest that at least 20% of applicants should immediately be declared inadmissible under the International Protection Act 2015. Furthermore, given that a further 40% of applicants are coming from countries such as Algeria, Somalia, Nigeria and Zimbabwe, it is fair to suggest that a majority of these applicants landed in another EU member state before Ireland and should this not therefore trigger the transfer of that applicant back to the other EU member state under the Dublin 3 regulations. The final area we will look at is a new pact that has been proposed by the European Commission in September 2020 regarding migration and asylum. The document on the screen is a communication from the Commission to the European Parliament and others and states the following. The new pact recognises that no member state should shoulder a disproportionate responsibility and that all member states should contribute to solidarity on a constant basis. This communication goes on to state. Drawing on the experience of the negotiations on the 2016 proposals to reform the common European asylum system, it is clear that an approach that goes beyond the limitations of the current Dublin regulations is required. Rules for determining the member state responsible for an asylum claim should be part of a common framework and offer smarter and more flexible tools to help member states facing the greatest challenges. This new common framework will set out the principles and structures needed for an integrated approach for migration and asylum policy, which ensures a fair sharing of responsibility and addresses effectively mixed arrivals of persons in need of international protection and those who are not. This includes a new solidarity mechanism to embed fairness into the EU asylum system, reflecting the different challenges created by different geographical locations and ensuring that all contribute through solidarity so that the real needs created by irregular arrivals of migrants and asylum seekers are not handled by individual member states alone, but by the EU as a whole. The proposed wording of this new regulation was also published in September 2020. This regulation sets out the solidarity measures that Ireland may be obliged to comply with should Ireland opt into this regulation. As stated previously, Ireland has an opt-out on any laws which the EU wishes to enact in the areas of freedom, security and justice, which includes immigration and asylum. What this proposed new regulation is saying is that, in times of migration pressure or in general in relation to those who are accessing the EU arising from search and rescue operations, so those accessing the EU by boat, the Dublin 3 regulations, which currently allows Ireland to transfer applicants back to the first member state where their fingerprints were stored or an asylum claim lodged, would no longer apply. And instead, Ireland would be obliged to accept relocation of whatever number the European Commission considers to be Ireland's fair share of third country nationals, according to our population and GDP. 
As stated earlier, given the geographical location of Ireland and the countries those seeking international protection are travelling from, the Dublin Three regulations benefit Ireland more than most other EU member states. So any attempt to enforce new solidarity measures on Ireland, which would amend the Dublin Three regulations, must be strenuously resisted. Also, as stated several times in this video, Ireland has an opt-out in the areas of freedom, security and justice, meaning that even if this regulation is passed by the European Parliament, the Oireachtas would still have to agree to opt into this new regulation, which would undoubtedly be to Ireland's detriment. Before I conclude this video, I just wanted to highlight one further issue. And this concerns recent communications from Irish politicians saying that Ireland could have to provide asylum for victims of climate change. I know many people laughed when they heard this being reported in the news, but I would urge you to exercise extreme caution because this was not a flippant remark, but an agenda to lay the groundwork for the acceptance of climate asylum claims. I say this because in 2020, the United Nations Human Rights Committee found that climate induced displaced persons cannot be sent back to their home countries where their right to life is threatened because of the effects of climate change. This decision has been called a groundbreaking ruling that opens the doorway to future protection claims from individuals claiming their lives are threatened due to climate change. This is something that we must seriously watch into the future, especially from the perspective of people saying that Ireland has a legal obligation to accept an uncapped number of international protection applicants. To conclude this video, please see the following summary points. 1. Under the Treaty of Amsterdam, Ireland has an opt-out from legislation adopted in the areas of freedom, security and justice, which includes immigration and asylum. This means that Ireland is not bound by EU law in the areas of immigration or asylum unless Ireland voluntarily decides to opt into these laws. Where Ireland does not voluntarily opt into these laws, any legislation which is adopted in any of these areas binds the other member states but not Ireland. Effectively, this means two things. A. Ireland has no EU obligations regarding immigration and asylum unless the Oireachtas voluntarily decides to opt Ireland into such laws. And B. Ireland's membership of the European Union is not threatened if it fails to adopt EU laws in the areas of immigration and asylum, given that Ireland's right to opt out of these laws is legally binding upon the European Union. 2. Under the Dublin Three regulations, the European Union, Iceland, Switzerland, Norway and Liechtenstein have all agreed that asylum applications are to be processed by the country in which an asylum claim is first lodged or where fingerprints are first stored. The provisions of the Dublin Three regulations are far more favourable to countries like Ireland than most other EU countries, as given our geographical location, it is quite likely that a person will have made an application for international protection in one of the other countries mentioned before journeying to Ireland. And where this is the case, Ireland is entitled to transfer an asylum applicant back to that country for processing. And three, under the International Protection Act 2015, an application for international protection is inadmissible where A. Another member state has granted refugee status or subsidiary protection status to the person. B. A country other than a member state is a first country of asylum for the person or C, the person arrived in the state from a safe third country that is a safe third country for that person. With regards to persons arriving in Ireland from safe countries, we know that at least 20% of applicants are coming to Ireland from Georgia, noting that Georgia has been declared a safe country of origin under Regulation 121 of 2018. In addition, it is quite likely given the geographical location of the other top nationalities arriving in Ireland that the majority of these applicants landed in another EU member state before Ireland and this should therefore trigger the transfer of that applicant back to the other EU member state under the Dublin Three regulations. So when a politician says Ireland must accept uncapped numbers of persons seeking protection under international law, please use the information in this video to arm yourself from both a legal and financial perspective. To assist you in this regard, I've included a link in the description box of this video, which sets out all the information in this video. Thanks for listening.